welcome to the Michael Uzes Podcast. Welcome back, Michael Uzes Podcast. Emma Pace, part of the North Group real estate team, co-founder in Sales Genius, sold over $150 million of real estate, the very first seven-figure agent in Zucasa brokerage history, been on CBC Daily Hive, Toronto Sun, the absolute goat in AI. I don't know anyone who's doing it better than you. And uh, Pipeline Profit, podcaster, and most importantly of all, a DJ. Welcome to the <laughs> used podcast. To <laughs> used to be. I'm, Welcome to the podcast, I'm a Emma Pace. <laughs> Thank you for having me. I'm a, I'm a washed up DJ, but I'll take it. Okay, let's start there because obviously it's a big thing we have in common. Um, I love DJing as well. And how'd you get into DJing? Like, where'd you start? Like, what was, where did this start? And what did you, what kind of gear were you using? You know, you know, it's funny because um, I played hockey and I know that that's part of your, your past too. And yep. so I played um, like basically AAA. It, it, uh, women at that point in time, we were only like up to double A, right? So I played double A, like the highest kind of level hockey that we could. Um, and a, a bunch of my friends were all getting drafted, um, or sorry, um, scholarships in the uh, in the States. And so I was like, I was thinking about it when I was getting out of high school. And I'm like, do I really want to double down on this hockey thing? Because I was a good hockey player. But I was like, always, I loved partying too, right? Okay. And I was like, I was thinking about my future. And I'm like, okay, you know, grade 11, grade 12, you really got to, you re- if you want to do the hockey thing, like you really got to triple down on like, this yep. is what I'm going to do. And also this is what I'm going to invest the next four to six years of my life. Really, you know, two practices a day, this, that, and the other, like that is your life. And so I kept, th- I kept going back and forth and I'm like, do I, is this the life that I want is what I was thinking. And then I was like, you know what? I was just, I always was like, ah. I don't know. I feel like there's something more. And uh, I remember I went to Tiesto to see Tiesto when I was in grade 12. And I had always been into music and stuff like that. And I was like, fuck, I need to get some gear for sure. Um, And I remember I asked my mom because like I can't remember when you get a credit card, but I asked my mom, I was like, listen, what do you think about me buying DJ equipment? And I was like, you know, I just wanted a little control or whatever. And she's like, no, (laughs) that's not happening. I'm not buying that for you on my credit card, whatever it happens to be. So fast forward a few months later, I was messing around with like virtual DJ and stuff like that on my computer, just like, you know, messing around, whatever. And uh, somehow figured out this way to be able to make this purchase and this this equipment shows up at my house and my mom's like what the heck is this i'll open up the box she's like i told you not to buy this what the hell are you doing and that was like the catalyst to me starting and i I dj'd for the next 10 years um that's what transitioned me from moving to london to moving to toronto um we played kind of all over the place like we played at hoxton we played at coda we we played some good shows like that was the thing that i did for the next uh 10 years and then that transitioned me into real estate because i was working full-time and i was djing and i'm like i want more time to dj i didn't move to toronto to like work this crappy corporate job and as soon as i switched over to getting my real estate license i was like oh shit i guess i have no time at all for djing (laughs) anymore and that's how it got me uh here to you know all those companies and stuff like that that you had mentioned at the beginning but uh but i i loved i loved djing for for that period of time it was like you know 18 to 28 is is when i that was like my main my main little run there that's pretty awesome so um Actually, I didn't know you played like double A competitive hockey. Like I knew you, I knew you were interested in hockey. So yeah, um, when you were playing, did you, you were playing in London at the time? Yeah, I played in London. So um, I played for London Devilettes, which is like one of the, you know, I guess biggest kind of like women's junior hockey teams um, for the, the, you know, the, the bulk of my life. And then uh, we moved out to this other area of London and I ended up playing for Strathroy um for a while as well um but no we did well i mean we won uh offsa back to back um you know uh we won all ontarios i forget what they it, not for school i forget what like the ontario games like we were you know we were a good hockey team um a couple of my friends made it to team canada so you know we had a we had a, a good crew for sure yeah that's amazing um and have you gone to see any pwhl games yet 
I have not. No, but a couple of my actually clients and friends uh, are coaches. Okay, awesome. Well, yeah. go see it. I mean, I've been watching online. The hockey looks pretty awesome. Obviously, some of the best, well, most of the best players in the world, if not all of them. Um, yeah. Okay, so let, so then you get into DJing. Ten years, you get the controller. Um, which is kind of where everyone starts, you know, and virtual DJ. I do remember that too. Now it's back actually. I don't know if you saw that. Is it back? Now, I didn't yeah. know that. I didn't know that. So now you can use it on some of the controllers have it built in and you can like, it's all digital built in the controller, which is cool. Yeah. But um, yeah. when you were DJing, like how did you start getting these gigs downtown? Like like playing at the Hoxton and Coda, like that's a pretty big deal. Like how did you just get into that? Dude, and you know, it's crazy. I have adopted the same mentality in my real estate career as I did with DJ. So I was like, I want to get good at this. I, I never like to start anything. Like I always want to be the best at anything that I do. So there was like this DJ school that started in London. And um, it was this guy I kept seeing. His name's DJ Ruckus. He was like, you know, he, he played all, downtown London all the time. And uh, he was going to be like the teacher. And I'm like, oh how am I going to build a relationship with this guy? I'm just going to pay to go to his courses and get him to teach me. Right. And so he taught us on controllers. And then he also taught me to spin vinyl because he was a vinyl DJ. Um, and I would go, and I think it was like, like an eight to like 12 week type program or whatever. You go like once or twice a week. I can't, it was so long ago. I can't even remember the exact cadence, but um, what happened was I was practicing. I'd go in, I'd practice. Like I just wanted to get really, really good at it. And he was like, you're, you're actually pretty good kid. Um, and at the end of it, what they did was like a, a showcase for all the students. And I ended up winning the showcase. And I, I was like, I, I was always into like tech house and stuff. I know I listened to like electro and all that stuff at the beginning, but I love tech house. Um, and he liked my set so much. I ended up winning this competition and I got to do an opener set um, for like a Canada Day party, and it was like John Aquaviva was headlining. It was like it was actually like a big, uh, you know, it was a big bill, which was awesome, and crushed the set. Basically, no one was there though. By the way, it was like my friends and what, and the guy who was throwing the party, and the guy who was throwing the party came up after and was like, "Listen, that was your first set." I'm like, "Yeah." He's like, "Your track selection was amazing. Like your mixes were pretty good. Um, we'd be happy to have you back again." And so I continued to kind of like slowly develop that relationship with him. And he started to book me more and more and more in London and that like really upped the ranks. And then, um, I started to do the, it was like the era of like DJ competitions in London. So I was like going through all these DJ competitions and I had like won a bunch of them, which was awesome. So that got me like my first residency at a club in London. And then uh, it just kind of skyrocketed from there, man. Like I end up, um, I end up, I, I went to school for recording engineering and like uh, artist management and stuff like that. So I went to music industry arts in London, and that's where I met my DJ partner. That you know, we we became a, a group called City Kid Soul. I'm sure if you guys looked, probably still got some tracks that we produced and sets and all that kind of stuff online. Um, but from there, it was like people were just digging our vibe. Like they love the, our track selection. We were getting booked like headlining gigs in London. And then we met someone in Toronto at one of the parties that we were playing. And they were like, we want to book you in Toronto. And then it was like kind of same thing from there. Like we just developed the relationships in Toronto. And there was way more opportunity. Like we kind of capped out what we could do in London. We were playing, you know, headlining slots around. And then, um, yeah, moved to Toronto and started to you know just work our way up from like small little gigs um we played at this place called wrong bar a bunch uh that was on i think it was queen east if i'm not mistaken it's been shut down for a while now um and then just kind of scaled up like continued to build relationships and all that kind of stuff i think the one thing that set us apart was because we went to school for recording engineering we did production artist management we had like a pretty good grasp on the business side of things um but we loved producing our own tracks so we weren't just djs like we did produce our own music and i think that's the one thing that kind of set us apart is like in the era of a lot of people just mixing tracks and just being djs um we were putting our own tracks into our sets and people were digging digging the tracks. so we were getting signed to like little labels here or there but it kind of gave you that like authority or like that cloud a little bit at that time um and yeah there was just like these little you know these little things kind of looking back on it that helped to to kind of get us up there that's unreal and back then like not a, like you said not a lot of people were making music like now it's so easy to make music now there's a hundred programs out there that you can use and and the big the big two or three that are like anyone could download on the computer and start making 
start producing tracks, right? So if you're yeah. talking 10 years ago or, or more, like not as prevalent, I mean, it's kind of goes hand in hand with you being now the go to AI and, and ahead of that curve too. Like it makes sense. Um, that's unreal. And, um, so let's talk the transition to real estate. So you did that for yeah. 10 years. Um, actually I do have one more question. Like how, like, how is it living as a DJ from a standpoint of like, you're, you're playing till two, 3 AM. Like, like, is it kind of like you're on that, like nightclub kind of shift basically week after week yeah. type thing? Dude, I, I was running on fumes because I was working a corporate job. I'm not going to say the name of the company, but like we started at six, uh, usually six or six 30 and we would work like 12 hours, no breaks. And sometimes we'd start, like, I remember playing at Coda and we started at 3 AM. So I'm like getting off my set and going to work to my corporate job. Um, and I was just, I was just running on fumes and I just kept thinking like, did, you know, did I move from London to Toronto to climb the corporate ladder for this company? Like there's definitely opportunity there for me, but like, I'm in my early twenties. Like I gotta, you know, like I need to do what I can to like expand myself. And I, I mean that corporate job though, um, I've always been, I've always had like, kind of like a bit of an entrepreneurial spirit. Um, like even on the music side of things, like we were good to, you know, kind of, get better gigs or get paid or whatever it happens to be. Um, and, uh, so that job taught me a lot about running a business. Like we were running a quarter million dollar shop downtown Toronto at like 23. We weren't getting paid well for it, but we were still operating the business in that capacity. Right. So I got to see a lot of, um, different things from like hiring, training employees, managing, um, you know, managing inventory, this, that, and the other. Um, and so when I transitioned over to real estate, it, uh, I think I had like a good foundation on the business side of things. Um, and so, you know, there's definitely a big learning curve when you get into the real estate industry, and especially when you're like, you know, I was 25 when I got my license. Um, so it's like, you know, I didn't know anybody. I had no connections. None of my friends that I was partying with at the time had any money to fucking buy real estate. I'll tell you that for sure. Um, they were lucky to scrounge a hundred bucks for, for the weekend, uh, you know, to go to the bar or whatever it happens to be. Um, and then, so as soon as I did that transition, um, you know, my, my mentality was get rid of the corporate job, do real estate, uh, buy some of my time back and then be able to focus more on DJing, you know, to which we both know is, was not what fucking happened at all. <laughs> and, but that's okay. It, it is what it is. I mean, it's part of the journey, right? Yeah. That's, uh, that's really funny. The, the uh, getting a real estate to buy your time back is, is a, is a good one. Um, that was, if there's anything to be said about being 25, that, that statement right there just shows you that I was 25 for sure. Yeah. But you know what? Like I find it really interesting getting into real estate. So you were 25, which is much younger, like much younger than I was getting into the business at the start. And I do think though, having a foundation of corporate, you know, you've been there, you've, you've learned how to run a business and then you get into real estate. I think that is a bit of a differentiator for a lot of people that are getting into real estate. And maybe they don't have that like kind of business acumen before getting into real estate and basically building your own business, which is, which is what everyone's doing. Um, so that's really interesting. And how did that help you like from the get go? So now you, you've transitioned, now you're buying your time back, quote unquote, and DJing, what was that like? Like, what was the transition like in that aspect? I mean, when you're 25, uh, it's scary to get. I mean, it's actually. Let me rewind. It's not just about being 25. It's pro it was probably less scary for me than if you were older and you had more like financial commitments, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Like, think about the people who are do you know career changes and they've got kids and they got all this. Like, it was it was really scary for me at the time to give up the certainty because my 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 concern was if I make this transition, I give up all of my steady income to go and do this other thing where I have no guaranteed income and I screw it up, is it also going to screw up everything that I've worked for when it comes to the music side of things? Because if I can't afford to pay my rent and I can't live in Toronto and I got to move back with my parents, then, you know, I actually am erasing many years of hard work on the music side of things. So that was like my biggest concern. 
but you know, I I think that I've always been I don't want to say a risk taker, a calculated move maker is what I would say. So I'm like, all right, well, fuck, worst case scenario is I screw this up badly. Definitely a possibility that's on the table. I know myself, I'm willing to work hard. Very rarely when I bet on myself, do I let, you know, do I screw it up? So what's the probability and the likelihood? You know, it's definitely not zero over here. There's something, but I think that the likelihood or probability of me succeeding at this is significantly higher than me failing at it. And the thing is, if I fail at it, what's the likelihood that I could replace this income again? 99%, right? So am I going to make this calculated move? I thought it was a pretty good, I thought it was a pretty good um, bet on myself to do that. And, uh, and it worked out, it worked out. So I just jumped, uh, you know, in two feet deep, I figured out how I could make money, how I could have a steady stream of income in real estate was like, it wasn't the sexiest thing, but do some leases. I knew if I could just figure out how to do leases, like I could replace the income that I had at least, and then I could scale it up from there. Yeah, I, I love that. I think that's, it's an amazing lesson, right? Like uh, betting on yourself is is number one. And, and I think it's the challenge of any commission-based business, whether it's real estate or anything else, is like, you don't always know where the next paycheck is coming. But- the upside is there's no up, there's no limit on the upside. There's also no floor. But if you're betting on yourself and you're going to work for that, like chances are, if you put the actual effort in, it's going to go better than not. I would say probably most of the time, right? I mean, I think for most of us, when our backs are against the wall, it's pretty amazing what we can accomplish. You know, if I if I said to you like Mike, I by the end of day today, I need you to prepare me an hour presentation on AI. You'd be like, uh, well, I don't know what I'm doing. And I'd be like, I don't give a shit. I need it done by the end of the day. And you're like, if, if I was your boss, guess what? By the end of the day today, you'd figure out something. It might not be perfect, but you'd probably have something across to me by the end of the day, because you know, that pressure was put on you. And it's like when, when our backs are against the wall, I think we like underestimate ourselves way too often. When you, when you are up, you know, with your back against the wall and you have no other option, most of us figure it out. Yeah, I agree. Um, so what, so what would you, what would you recommend? So if somebody, whether they're starting at 25, 35 or whatever, like, and I know, uh, we'll get into your coaching aspect of it, um, as well, but you know, where do you recommend kind of starting the way you did, like starting with the leases? That's how I kind of got my feet wet too. And like really just kind of getting used to the buildings and the conversations and just finding a lockbox and putting together paperwork, honestly, like it seems like. It, it's a lot like you got to figure it out um what uh what would you recommend for anyone kind of starting especially at 25 like because that i feel yeah. like is is now where people are probably getting into the business i mean i, I won't say recommendation i'm just going to say what worked for me um because i think everybody's you know scenario is unique and whatever so i'll, I'll tell you what worked for me or why i think this worked for me it may work for whoever's listening. It may not. You might want to take a piece of it. Um, but like you said, learning the ropes, there's a lot to learn. This is what I, okay. So I, I think real estate agents, often we get like a bad rap, right? And I feel like what people don't understand is when you're a real estate agent, you are running the entire everything, the entire business by yourself. Sometimes we look at real estate agents like, oh, we're you know we're uh, technically sales representatives. Well, if you go to any other business, a sales representative has one job: the calls are booked in, they do the sales, another call comes in, they do the sale. It is what it is. But I gotta give a shout out to real estate agents because we do everything A to Z in a business. We do all the marketing, lead generation, leads come in. We got to convert those leads. We got to do the sales call. We got to transition them. We need to know where the lockbox is. We need to know the age of the home. We need to know how to get the information. We got to negotiate the contract. We got to coordinate closing gifts. We got to stay in call. You know what I mean? Like we're doing everything that a traditional business has several employees to do if you work somewhere else like if you work at like a corporate job typically i was only doing one of those you know you know multiple steps of what happens through like a customer's journey and so i think what happens is we get bogged down on like 
what's the first domino that I need to push down to make everything else fall in sequence? And it's interesting that you bring this up because on our podcast yesterday, we had a guest and he was talking about how he thinks that too many agents don't know the anatomy of a home. We're really good at like trying to find the leads and we, you know, we practice our sales and stuff like that. But when it comes to the actual product we're selling, we might understand the market statistics, but we don't give the confidence to the consumer or, you know, buyers if we're walking through the house and they're like, well, you know, how old is this or how much is it going to cost to fix this or whatever. And we don't spend enough time on like product knowledge. And I think that like, it's really easy when we go back to leases to be like, ah, oh, leases kind of suck. There are a lot of, you know, it's a lot of, of, of work for very little money in comparison to the sales side of things. But it's like getting paid to learn all of the things that you need to know for the foundation of the business. So I think like if I had to go back, if I had no knowledge, if I had zero knowledge, I was brand new in the industry, I would do the same thing again. And I'll tell you why, because my first sale came from transitioning a lease to a sale. Um, I wish I would have known that process and i'm happy to to discuss that process with you um because i think that anybody that's new should know this um i wish i would have figured that out sooner knowing what i know now i'd do that first day but um it's it's always been very interesting to me on the lease side of things okay we get way more information from someone on a lease than we do on the buy like how awkward is it to ask someone are you pre-approved how much what's your down payment like it's kind of like this gross feeling that we get as agents because it's like i feel like i'm literally prying into your financial you know your financial life but on the lease side of things it's mandatory for you to give that stuff to me in order for me to help you get a, uh, approved for a lease so like i need your credit score I need to know, you know, that you're employed. I need a recent, you know, letter of employment. Like I need all of these things. And that's pretty much mandatory for us to have access to before we can even give you advice as to whether or not we can help you or if we think that we can get you approved in a competitive um, rental marketplace. And so I changed my strategy and I said, all right, well, if I'm going to go out to find... I was doing a lot of Kijiji at the time. Facebook Marketplace, I think, had like just started, but it was like... <laughs> not a good user experience at the time. Um, and so what I end up doing, and this is what, you know, I tell new agents to do as well, if they don't have like buy or sell leads is figure out what areas you want to work in, figure out what the price point is and you know, how quickly do you want to transition into to buying and selling? Well, I would just put up ads for, you know, we'll talk about Toronto right now. I wouldn't be advertising a $2,000 a month rental listing because uh, when I get the credit and the income, the income is probably going to be a little bit less than what they would need to be able to actually afford to purchase a property. So I end up getting this application from this guy and he was making like, you know, decent six figures, amazing credit, good job. And I just said like, why are you not like, have you ever even considered purchasing? Like you, you make way more money than most people who buy a house. And he's like, really? He's like, I've never even thought about that. But when I saw his, you know, his portfolio that he'd given to me on the rental side of things, he was like, this is a no brainer. I'm absolutely happy to have the conversation. And so if I was to go back again, I would be advertising uh, or marketing for clients in a rental price range where I know that they likely have the income that they would be able to transition into buying later uh, or now. Maybe I might be able to transition to them now. So like if I'm going to go and you have a listing, Mike, let's say, and I say, hey, um, can I advertise your listing? And you go, yeah, yeah, of course. Bring me, bring me someone to lease my place. Well, it's going to take me the exact same amount of effort to advertise a $2,000 place or to advertise a $4,000 place doesn't like it's no difference the email to you is the same the time it's going to take me to post the thing is the same but the commission that i'm going to get is twice as much and the clientele or the leads that come through are twice as qualified so if i had to go back i would probably just get rid of skimming the bottom because i didn't feel worthy enough to deal with the clients that were four thousand dollars a month and i'd go directly there so that every lead that comes into my database as a new agent is somebody that I know could likely either purchase a home in the future or maybe would be open to having that conversation now. Yeah, I love that. I think it's I think it's a really good lesson because um, essentially like it depends on the market too. Like maybe that 2000 right now is not even getting you really a studio. 
And yeah. in general, most people would want, I mean, if usually everyone wants like kind of the one level up, right? So if you're going 2000, it'd be really tough if someone's kind of on the brink there versus going, like you said, 4,000 or 3000 or even something in the middle. Like, like, cause I find in the 2,500, I obviously I'm on my listings, uh, for landlords, a bit of a mix, like that 2,500 range, you do get a lot of volume of inquiries, but I find even on Facebook marketplace, you're getting, you might get like 50 messages but really only one or two people are actually interested because they just hit the button of like, is this available? Like on, it's so yeah. automatic on, on Facebook. Um, sure. So I, I do agree with that. Like maybe being a little more selective in what you're posting and just that way you can kind of filter through it. And so, yeah, so let's talk about like you were just mentioning how that transition goes because it is a difficult conversation if someone is looking to rent. And I think this is where asking the right questions, which um, having done one of your courses really like opened my whole brain up to like, I need to ask better questions uh, just in general. And, and we just had uh, um, Phil Jones on, on our oh. Zoom call. And, and now I'm just like mind blown on this question thing. So let's talk questions like when you're, so if someone comes in to sends you a message on Kijiji or whatever, and, and what kind of questions would you ask them now versus when you started, if you had to do it over again? I mean, I, there's, when it comes to, you know, we'll talk, I guess we're just talking like general sales. What we need to determine is um, what's their current situation now. I think what, what happens is with agents, and I see this all the time, and this is something that we, we teach in, in one of our coaching programs, is we often just go, okay, how, um, what are the features that you need? I need uh, two beds, two baths, and I want to be downtown. And then all of a sudden, it's like, okay, I got all the information that I need. I'll send you some listings, right? Like that, a 95% of agents just go down that path. Instead of saying, um, hey, Mike, you know what? Um, I am good. I'm happy to send you any listings and I'm happy to do the work for you, but I want to make sure that I'm not annoying you. Okay. And so is it all right if I ask you a couple questions just to make sure I can get the information that I need so that everything I send to you is valuable and I'm not wasting my time and I'm not wasting your time because if I don't get the right information, it's just going to waste both of our times. And then people are like, that makes sense. You're, you know, you're respectful of your own time and you want to be respectful of mine and nobody else has asked me this. So that's the first thing is like setting the frame of why you need the information. Because if you don't frame, you know, what you're about to ask, sometimes it feels like you're just probing and being nosy and you make someone feel uncomfortable. But if you frame and you set the right expectations for why you're going to be asking these questions, people are much more open-minded to asking the questions because they see the benefit. So oftentimes what we do is like, we just go feature, 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 feature. And I don't tell you what the hell the benefit is. And you're like, this just doesn't feel valuable to me. Right. And so if I said something like, Hey, is it all right if I ask you a couple questions just to make sure that the information that I'm sending to you is actually the best quality information? I'm not wasting your time. I'm not sending you 10,000 listings when you only need to see five. Let me just figure out what the five best are and you can tell me which ones you want to see from the five best. You're like, hell yeah, I don't want to go through a thousand, right? And then from there, I'd say, okay, the first thing I want to know, why are you even looking to move to a new place? Like, tell me about your current place. What do you like about your current place? And you're like, you know what? So when you start with the, why, why do you like your current place? It throws people off because they're like, normally a salesperson is going to ask me all the things that I don't like about my current place. Okay. But if you say, you know what, Emma, the thing that I really like about my current place is I've got an amazing view. And if I can't find another place with an amazing view, I'm not going to move. Okay, that's interesting. I wouldn't know that. So if I don't ask you that question about what you like and there's things in your current you know, property that you like and I didn't ask you that, I wouldn't know that the view would be a deal breaker because I might not have asked the, other, the, the right question on the other side, right? Um, so I always start with like, all right, tell me about your current situation. What do you like? All right, is there anything else? Anything else? Anything else? No, good. All right, on the flip side, what do you not like about your current place? And then it's like, I don't like this. I don't like this. I don't like this. And it's like, all right. So if I could find you a place with X, Y, and Z that, you know, kind of maintains what you have in your current property that you like, and but we could also get you this, this, and this, that would be essentially a lifestyle upgrade. You know, maybe it's saving money, whatever it happens to be the, you know, the, the true benefit to them. Because if, if you can't find them something better, 
that puts them in a better situation, they are not going to move anyways. So you might as well find out what the base layer is and how the hell do I beat that tenfold when I'm picking these you know, listings out instead of sending the 10,000 listings. And then what we end up doing as agents is we just frustrate ourselves. We're like, this dude never got back to me. I've been sending him emails for weeks. And it's like, you're sending him emails and making him do way more work than he wants to do because you didn't ask the right questions on the front end, right? Um, so determining where they're at now, where they want to go, and how you're able to bridge that gap will give you the information as the agent to provide information in an email or follow-up that's actually valuable to the person on the other end so that they'll actually respond to you. Yeah, I love that. That's uh, It's really it's really good like to hear that because sometimes you're right. And, and I'm, I'm, I think we're all guilty of that is like, okay, what are you looking for? Uh, one bedroom, one bathroom. Do you need parking? Yes. Yeah. What's your square footage? Even that question, like the square footage is like such a weird question because 600 square feet in one with a hundred square foot hallway might not feel as big as a 550 square foot unit with no hallway. It right. could be a t- so it's like such a subjective, so kind of getting to the root of like why they need 600 square feet is more important than how big do you want, for example. Yeah. So, so one of the things that we do, I'll give you a secret hack. I wasn't going to share this, but I'll, I'll share it anyways. This is a game that we actually play. Um, we've been doing it more with our coaching clients. We do it internally with the team. And this is something that I do like you know, internally, mentally when I'm writing my emails or maybe I'm writing like copy for a landing page. And I call it the so what game, right? And the issue is with a lot of agents, when you're booking appointments, okay, maybe you have like, and I see this all the time, you have an amazing call. Sometimes we have these amazing calls with people. It'll be like 20 or 30 minutes we're on the phone with them. And you're thinking, okay, I got to book this appointment. How am I going to, how am I going to get this person off the phone onto like a, you know, a a buyer consultation, listing uh, presentation, whatever it happens to be. And what we do is we're like, you should come to this appointment because X, Y, and Z. And what do they do? They insert feature one, two, and three. But what you need to do is this game, the so what game, is you say a feature and then I go, so what? And you have to say, so what that uh, what that means for you is, and that's the benefit, right? So like, I'll give you an example. Uh, let's say you have a new listing and it's got like um, energy efficient appliances. Our new listing has energy efficient appliances. Does anybody give a shit about that? No, that's a feature. You know what they give a shit about? Energy efficient appliances are going to save you money on your utilities every month. The saving money is the benefit, right? So if I go, we got energy efficient appliances, you go, so what? I go, so what that means for you is that you're going to save money every single month and you'll have more disposable income to go to the bar with your friends. The second thing that I just said there is the reason that you would want energy efficient appliances or whatever the feature is to to lock them into the appointment, right? So it's like, hey, I'm going to, go over the entire buying process with you. That would be something that we would say as like a feature of showing up to a buyer consultation, right? I'll go over the entire buying process for you. Okay, good. So what that means for you is that you're going to have a clear vision of exactly what's going to happen every step of the way so that you're not confused. You know exactly where you are and if you're on track. That's what they want to know is like, how long is this shit going to take me? What's the process going to look like? Like those are the things that they want. So if you're struggling to book a book appointments and you're listening to this, I would encourage you to go through like how you're closing those appointments and go, okay, am I actually saying the features? And if I'm saying the features, I should write. So what that means for you after and whatever follows that. So what that means for you is the reason they're coming to the appointment. And you need to make sure that you say that on the call. Yeah, that's, uh, that's amazing. I, I love that. Um, and just, while we're here so this is part of your sales genius course is this like what you're teaching or your coaching courses and stuff like that can we talk about that like yeah totally yeah so i'll I'll give you kind of a rundown of like even since you and i have met i feel like my trajectory has changed a lot because i had a small team i did a merger with my small team with a larger team so now we've got 21 or 22 agents um and then i also run um, sales genius, which is a coaching and training company for agents. Um, and the reason why I still do both is because I've found a lot of, this isn't, this isn't a knock to like other coaches or, or anything like that. Um, but what I find is like for the first two or three years that someone transitions out of their, 
uh, primary business function into becoming a coach, what they're teaching is extremely relevant, like very relevant. But over a certain period of time, there's like a point of diminishing returns because you're not actively doing the activities anymore. So you're talking about, you know, and, and we're, you know, we're talking about AI and we're talking about how fast things move two to three years from now, what I'm, you know, what I am teaching today may, I might have to switch that up. It might not be relevant anymore. So I don't want to build all of sales genius off of what I'm doing today. And then in three years, keep teaching you the same shit because it might not be relevant. I need to be able to tweak. And so Ryan and I actually have a very good hybrid where, um, we are, what we're teaching in sales genius is like actually what we do with our team. We, we just do it with 22 people. So we have a lot of data, um, and th their benefit is that like they get all of that stuff for being a part of the team and they get all the stuff first, which is awesome. Right. Um, and so I handle the bulk of the marketing for North group. I'm the CMO there. So I handle like lead generation, developing strategies, all that kind of stuff on the marketing side. And then Ryan handles, uh, predominantly the sales training. So ensuring that they're like following up in the appropriate way, know what to say on the phones, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but we teach all of that stuff in sales genius as well. So like all of the, the information that we, you know, have within our team, you can have public access to as an agent, you, you obviously got to pay for the, the coaching and whatnot. Um, but we've got, you know, we've got a ton of stuff in there and we got a ton of stuff on the roadmap. Um, but you know, essentially what, what sales genius is, if I could boil it down to anything, it's a cringe free sales strategies that actually work or lead conversion strategies that actually work where you don't feel like gross about doing it. How did you get into coaching in the first place? Like, like you're so good at it. Uh, we met obviously in the agent confidential, which is super highly recommended. Like it actually has changed my entire business and, um, it's, oh, been, man, it's been huge. Yeah. And I, I tell tall all the time here in the office as well, but, um, that's how we met. And obviously, uh, now we've been, we've known each other for a couple of years now, which is crazy. It's already been like yeah. at, at least a year and a half or whatever. I don't know. Yeah. A year and a half. Yeah. Yeah. About, yeah, yeah. Um, so how did you get into coaching? Like where, where did it come for you where you're like, all right, I, I want to teach what I'm doing. Um, honestly, that was kind of the starting point, which is crazy. So when I first got into real estate, I was doing the least thing, but I, again, I've always been, you know, even going back to when I like paid for the DJ lessons at the beginning. I have always been down to pay to get in the room because I'm like, if I could just get access to somebody who already knows what the heck they're doing and it costs me a thousand bucks to have the conversation, I'm down. I'll figure out a way to get the thousand bucks if I know that that conversation is going to make me 10, right? Um, and so what happened was at the beginning of my real estate career, I took an eight week boot camp. And it was, like you said, I still use things in my business today. It's been nearly 10 years later that I learned in that boot camp. And I was like, I spent a thousand bucks to go to the boot camp, And it was like, it gave me all these systems and processes and all this stuff that like, it would have taken me years to figure out. Right. Um, and so what happened was I, you know, we, we started to refine it and I had, you know, lots of good processes over the, I think it was, you know, seven years or whatever, when we started the agent confidential. And I was like, I want to do this boot camp. I, I want to do our own boot camp for our audience. And then I'm thinking like, well, how the heck am I going to do this? And I was like, I, I have all the content, but I need somebody with a bigger audience than, than myself. And so I was like, I always liked Tom, um, him and I kind of lived in the same area, but like we didn't really, we knew of each other, but we didn't know each other. And I was like, I need to, I want to meet, I, I want to network with more people who are ahead of me is what I was thinking. And so I messaged him and I was like, you know what? There's no chance this dude's ever going to get back to me. He's not going to want to like meet for a beer, anything like that. Sh you know, sure enough, send, send him a message. He messaged me back. Yeah, actually I'm in the area you want to meet. We met at um, Mill Street Brewery, had a beer, just, you know, shot the shit. There was no, it was just to meet. There was no, no pitch on the boot camp or anything like that. I just wanted to meet him and like get to know him and expand the network. And, um, just kind of became friends from there. And then like a couple, you know, a couple months later I said to him, I'm like, listen, I think we have something here. Would you be open-minded to at least trying it again, going back to the, the sales thing we were talking, would you be open-minded to this? Same thing with Tom. Would you be open-minded to even try in this eight week boot camp? He's like, that sounds cool. Like, how are we going to do it? I'm like, I don't know, dude, we'll, let's figure it out. Um, you know, this is what the eight, you know, this is what I imagine the eight weeks look like. I don't know. We'll do it. We're going to do it live to make sure that like, it's not pre-recorded. People show up every week and like they can get our feedback and stuff like that. Let's just make it fucking amazing. 
like the only thing I want is for us to invest a bunch of time building out this cool eight week program and then just have a bunch of people uh, come on and like, we'll just like open up, you know, our, our, our systems and our book, we'll give it to them. Like, why not? And he was like, yeah, let's do it. And then I think we had like 50 people sign up for the first one. And then people were getting crazy results out of it. Like, we're still talking about it now a year and a half later and you're saying like it it changed your business and as soon as i saw that i was like i have a lot of internal assets within my business that work so well for us and nobody else has any idea what we're doing why don't i share this I'm, I'm okay to share this. Like it's, it's okay for your business to win. Doesn't, it's not a zero sum game. Like I don't have to win and you lose for it to be a zero sum game. You know, I'm happy to give you the resources. Uh, you know, it's a good exchange. I make money and you get a bunch of stuff that's already working. Like we both win at the end of the day. Um, and so I think as we continue to scale and I want to grow a bigger business and I look at, you know, my, my future and what I want for myself, um, that's, that's kind of where I see us going is like, let's just open up the playbook for everything that's worked well for us and give it to other people to kind of install in, in their business. Yeah, it, it makes total sense. And, and I also like, I know this, if I relate back to like playing hockey and, and training goalies and stuff, you actually refine and better your systems when you're teaching them. Oh, for now, sure. Cause now it forces you to actually look at them. Okay. From a bird's eye view and say, okay, this, this is why I do this and how I do this but now I need to teach it. So if I'm going to teach it, I really need to whatever systematize it or just have a really clear like way of presenting it so that the next person. So if you have 22 team members, you being able to articulate exactly how you do it to them will obviously make them more productive, which in turn, if they're on your team is going to help make you more production as well so it's like a hundred percent it's just something that keeps the engine running and at the same time too like as you're sharing stuff and you're developing new tools and you're just you're just continuing to evolve as everyone's just trying to figure out the last 10 things you're you trying to totally do. <laughs> and and i feel like i've always i've always been like on the technology side of things I, I like that's my passion man i love to learn i love ai i love to learn about the new stuff that's coming out building workflows and like saying oh you know what this software paired with this software and doing this this and this gives me the most efficient way to be able to get here like most i, I think most agents don't really like that doesn't excite them but it's for most people that was like, holy shit, that sounds boring as hell. But for me, it's just like, I don't know. Like, that's just one of the things I've liked. I think it, it goes back to like recording, engineering and producing music. Most people don't want to sit at their computer and listen to the same freaking sound for like six hours till they tweak it. And it's perfect. But like, I have something broken in my head and like, it's fine with me. Um, and it's translated very well into business. But like, if I'm going to build those things and I build it for myself, and it's like something that I could just say, hey, Mike, take this, click this and install it in your business. You're like, that would have taken me freaking three years. I'm like, yeah, it did take me three years. Do you want to do an exchange? Like, I'll sell it to you for this. And you're like, yeah, I'm down. Let's do it. Right. Um, so I, I have I don't I don't know. I think that as you grow in business um, and, and Ryan and I have had a million conversations about when we started in real estate in comparison to like where real estate is now, it's changed a lot, man. Like I remember what starting in real estate and they'd be like, you have to be so, uh, cautious with your clients and other age, other agents are going to like shark your clients or snake your clients. And, like, you have to be so careful cause they're going to come and poach them. And I feel like the vibe has been become much more collaborative teams are a much more prevalent thing they weren't very prevalent when we first started um and i think it's like we're all on like our lonely little islands feeling like we have no freaking clue what the hell we're doing and it's like why don't i just share the things that work well for me and you can take the things that you know will fit within your business and plug them in to make your business better like let's just help each other yeah and it makes everyone better too because then everyone's trying to you know especially from what I've seen in my few years in the business anyway, and you, you would have a lot more experience in that, but like Tom, Tom's here. I asked him a question, you know, he's always happy to help. And I try to repay the favor by, if I find something cool, like I would be like, Tom, what do you think of this? Like, is this, could this work or whatever? And then 
typical Tom fashion. He just takes it and makes it way better anyway. But um, <laughs> that's him. Oh, goes. He's a smart guy. Yeah, but um, no, I think that's incredible. Uh, so the Golden AI, uh, you did that presentation actually at Tom's uh, Agent Confidential Live last year, which is really cool. And yeah. Um, what are your thoughts on AI? Like, are they going to take over realtors or what? Is this, is this a thing we should be afraid of? Or? I don't, I don't <laughs> think that AI is going to take over realtors, um, especially because we are emotional, we are emotional beings. Um, and this is, you know, typically one of our biggest assets. I think people would be pretty f- weirded out to do everything. Start. There might be some people that want to do it start to finish right online. Um, but I think the human element will always be there when it comes to transacting in real estate. So my thoughts are, I don't think AI is going to take over, but I think the people that use AI are going to crush the people that don't use AI. Um, and, and it's so funny because, um, you know who Tucker Max is? Have you ever, did you, when we were like in high school, he released this movie called, uh, I hope they serve beer in hell. And he had a book and stuff like that. And he was like, um, he was like the Andrew Tate of 2009 or something like that. Super popular for being like a womanizer and this, that, and the other, but the guy's like an amazing, amazing. Um, he actually did David Goggins book, uh, like can't hurt me. He's done some of like, he's an amazing publisher and, uh, an editor. Um, and one of the things that he said, uh, I was at a mastermind and he was talking last week and he was like, you know, what's so interesting is, um, when we were growing up, people who had handmade shit were like, oh, th- why would you have handmade shit? Why wouldn't you want something that's like, you know, manufactured? Now, fast forward t- to today, anything handmade is considered better than something that's, you know, mass made. And so my kind of thought process is in, you know, 10 or 15 years from now, are we going to have like little disclaimers like written by a human? You know what I mean? It's like the human created thing going to be that niche like artisanal business thing because it was crafted by is human crafted instead of ai crafted i think that like these are little things that we got to take into consideration like as we progress um but i do think that um if you aren't spending any time learning ai right now you're an agent even if you're even if you're um like a buyer or seller and you're listening to this you're missing out huge. You have so many opportunities to like leverage additional research, get better with your strategies, um, build better tools, better systems, uh, reduce your costs. Um, you know, like uh, essentially the way that we run our business now is like one person is able to run three softwares and can basically do the output of three different people. Um, so it's like, again, going back to like building the workflows and becoming like the most efficient, most highly productive business. I don't need 20 people because I don't want to manage 20 people. I only need like five people to do 20 people's work. And now I get to choose who are the five people that I really like to work with. Um, I could probably pay those people each individually a little bit more than I would otherwise need to. If I had to have a payroll for 20, they're super happy. We have great culture and we build the tools and systems to make them much more efficient and we get the same output of 20 people but with five people and we run a kick-ass you know amazing culture company and everybody's happy kind of thing and like that's obviously the dream situation because it's business and there's stuff that messes up every day Uh, but we become more efficient have less costs and still get the same output yeah it's perfect i i agree with that i don't there is still a human element of going walking through a property like you mentioned knowing the anatomy of a house like an AI tool, even on if it comes to evaluation, um, and they're very often wrong. Like I've seen it, even if I change the front photo of a listing, the projected price value changes. Right. Same, right, right. same listing, different front photo, like the outside of the house versus the living room or something. Yeah. And now yeah. you have like a twenty thousand dollar gap. So. Um, I mean, yeah. I think I think AI will. You know, we're still early. You know what I mean? Like we're still, we're still so, 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 so early. Um, But I do think AI will probably get fairly good from a valuations perspective. However, when it comes to the human element, and I I always tell people this, it's like um, the, the internal things that we value 
are there's certain things about a house that like you and I could say objectively this is what it's valued as you know like your lot size on a you know um uh you know frontage basis should be this like if we go to like these scientific calculations or whatever we predetermine are these you know objective calculations okay well AI is going to be able to do will be able to do that probably as good as you or I in the next say three four years what it cannot take into consideration is this thing has an amazing backyard um and i've got three kids and right now we're living in a, in a condo with no outdoor space and this and we we need to move and this uh this property right here is in their school district and is the only property you know what i mean and it's like my my intrinsic motivation that is subjective based on my pain point with where i currently live i don't think it's going to be able to like i could be wrong i could you know we could fast forward this in five years i could be completely incorrect um but i think those things are the human element that provide the variance of like not really understanding the internal motivation we can have those objective calculations out there all day long but uh if you're living in a place and your kids are constantly like well you know why you know why does my friend have this backyard and this that and the other and you're like dude like i feel horrible by not being able to give this to them and then that house pops up you're going to be willing to pay a bit more for that house um you know what i mean so i think those are kind of the the small things when it comes to real estate not not necessarily i mean they seem small but they make the biggest impact on like valuation and um why property sell for what they do yeah totally 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 agree with that like it'll be really hard to replicate that because even if you tell an ai that kind of detail it's might be hard to find it. Um, yeah. Okay. Let's uh, honestly thank you so much for your time. Let's let's wrap up here. I mean, it's been an hour. It's been quick. I feel like we can go on for <laughs> forever. Um, let why don't you let everyone know uh, your your podcast and your sales genius and everything that you're doing yeah. and what's coming next and. Um, yeah, you if have? you if you want sales and marketing tips, our podcast is called Pipeline Profits and predominantly we just go through, you know, things that are working well in sales, different marketing strategies, um, operating your business, all that kind of stuff. So if you're interested in that type of, of content, um, then the podcast is great. We've got tons of great, great guests in the pipeline as well. Um, if anybody's interested in learning more about sales genius, um, there's a couple, there's actually a couple cool tools. If you want, uh, just for your audience, you guys can totally have these for free. Um, if you guys want, I'll give you the AI tool. It's probably the most relevant to the, the conversation. Um, but I built this AI tool called email magic. And essentially what this tool does is once you have a conversation with someone, so like, let's say you and I just had a conversation and I hung up the phone, right? Um, if we're doing calls in a call session, it's this awkward period of, should I send him the email now or should I continue to make my calls? And then should I like bulk email at the end of the day? So what happens is if I send you an email now, I disrupt my call flow, right? Maybe I should just get back on the phone because like I'm in a good groove. But if I don't send you the email now, then I'm relying on my motivation at the end of the day to go bang out these emails and like we're human. So it pretty much never happens. And then people are like, where's the email, right? So I built this tool to close the gap. So essentially if you and I got off a, a conversation, let's say you're a buyer, you say, you know, I'm not ready to buy right now, but I need information on a down payment. I would put your name in. I would put in uh, the time frame to which I said I would follow up with you, so maybe two weeks. And then I would put in a link to an article that I think would be relevant to help you. So maybe it's in, maybe it's a blog on like you know uh, down payment requirements in Ontario or something like that. And I would click send. Uh, I would click submit on this tool, which I'll give you here, and it writes the rec it writes the whole follow up email for you, and it writes a summary of cool. that article. So if they don't need to, they don't actually even need to read the article. So it's high value takes you zero time and you make sure they don't miss any emails. So that's called email magic. You can get it by going to salesgenius.co slash email magic. Um, and it's, it's completely free. Just like go on there, use it as, as many times as you guys want and uh, make your business as efficient as you possibly can. That's incredible. I'll, uh, I'll link that down below and uh, maybe I'll get you to just to send over yeah. whatever, um, just, just all the links for everyone to, yeah. to follow you and everything. Emma, thank you so much. It's so amazing. Um, Thanks for if, having me. if you guys are doing the boot camp again, uh, anyone listening to this, make sure to jump into it. I know we are doing the boot camp and yeah. we're doing it big this time. So, uh, I don't know when this will be released. Um, but we are collaborating with a big company 
this time and we're going to be doing it large so if anybody wants to get in the boot camp this one's going to be pretty cool when uh when is the new one starting up february 12th february 12th okay i'll make sure we'll get this out uh pretty soon and that way it'll be right before then and then if you are just a boot camp definitely go sign up emma thank you so much uh i think everyone's going to really enjoy this thanks for having me i appreciate it